I acknowledge and appreciate that I live on Treaty 7 land, the ancient home of the Nitsitipi, composed of the Siksika, Kainai, and Pekani nations, the Stony Nakoda and Sutina peoples, along with Métis Region 3 and the Inuit peoples who have called this land on Turtle Island home. I acknowledge my home of Airdrie, the beauty of Banff that provides refuge, the city of Calgary, traditionally named Mokinstis, where my family settled, and the other lands that we humbly share. I acknowledge the land and her provision for her children, from the river that provides the trees and bushes that make good bows, to the rose hips that keep us healthy in the winter. I acknowledge the Creator who gifted us with this land to share and care for. I recognize the traditional and honorary knowledge keepers who have taught me and remind us all of their heart of mutuality and care and of the injustices that have occurred at the hands of those who dishonored the sacred treaty. I acknowledge my responsibility as a child of the Creator, as a Christian, as an educator, and as an inhabitant of Treaty 7 to share and listen to the stories of Indigenous peoples, to honor the ongoing work of reconciliation, the thoughtful implementation of Indigenous ways of knowing, and to uplift Indigenous voices as they call out for justice in our society. I pray for this land and all who inhabit it, that we might work together towards justice, peace, and love. Good evening, everyone. My name is Marva Gertsen, and I'm the Director of Alumni and Community Engagement here at Ambrose University. And I'm so thrilled that you've cho chosen to join with us this evening for our third and final lecture of the semester. I know that you are really going to enjoy this evening's topic. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items for you all. Uh, as this is a webinar, at the bottom of your page, you will see a button that says Q&A. Throughout the lecture, if you have questions that you would like to be addressed at the very end, feel free to pop them in there at any time. And then following the lecture during the Q&A, uh, we will be addressing as many as time allows. This evening, we have Dr. Murray McTavish, who has joined Ambrose University in August of 2020. He will be here moderating the conversation. Murray serves as the Associate Dean of School of Business and the Associate Professor of Leadership and International Develop Development. Uh, Dr. McTavish began his career teaching life and work skills to homeless teenagers in Canada, and he later worked for an economic empowerment group and taught youth in various U.S. cities how to become entrepreneurs. We're thrilled to have him guide our conversation this evening, so thank you for being with us, Murray. Without any further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Pam Nordstrom, our provost, as well as the vice president of academics, to introduce our presenters this evening. Hi, my name is Pam Nordstrom, Provost and Vice President Academic here at Ambrose. It is my honor to introduce to you our speakers for this evening. Derek Cook serves as the Director of the Canadian Poverty Institute here at Ambrose University, and he also teaches courses in community development. In this role, he recently served on the Ministerial Advisory Committee on Poverty, advising the federal government on the development of the Canadian Poverty Reduction Strategy. Derek also serves in the Commission on Justice and Peace of the Canadian Council of Churches, as well as on the boards of Canada Without Poverty and Mennonite Central Committee, Alberta. Previously, he worked many years at the City of Calgary as a research and policy advisor and led the Mayor's Task Force on Poverty Reduction. Derek also worked as a community development worker with a variety of nonprofit organizations across Canada. He holds a Master's of Science in Rural Planning and Development and a Certificate in Knowledge Mobilization from the University of Guelph, a BA in Political Science from McGill University, and he is a registered social worker in the province of Alberta. Dr. Alex Sanderson is an Associate Professor at Ambrose and the Chair of the Department of Social Sciences. 
She graduated with a doctorate from the University of Calgary Division of Applied Psychology program in 2001. Her research interests have focused on using narrative perspectives for understanding the factors that contribute to the development of behavioral and emotional difficulties or resiliency in youth. Her teaching interests include narrative psychology, developmental psychopathology, qualitative research methods, and personality. These two colleagues are positioned well to lead our discussion this evening, which they have titled Developmental Aspects of Poverty and Why It Should Matter to You. Besides their academic credentials, scholarly expertise, and wealth of experience as practitioners, they are very personable people. They like nothing better than to engage in dialogue about this subject. I hope this evening you will recognize them as conversation partners and that you will ask these passionate advocates for youth experiencing poverty why this situation should matter to you. Welcome, Alex and Derek. Good evening and welcome. Thank you, Pam and Marva. It's my privilege to be here with professors Alex Sanderson and Derek Cook with you this evening. They are experts in their field and it's only matched by their care and concern for the students. They are, uh, as other faculty at Ambrose, are con committed to the community and to the learning of their students. Their extensive knowledge will be valuable to us as we listen to their presentations. You're probably uh, attending this event because the impacts of poverty are important to you and you're interested to learn more about the various issues uh, around poverty and we have two experts with us this evening. As Marva mentioned, uh, this is a great opportunity for you to learn, but also what I appreciate about these uh, virtual seminars is that you can ask questions. So at the end, as Marva said, you'll have a chance to uh, have questions asked and uh, our two panelists can speak to those. You know, there's a growing poverty issue. We see it around. It's known throughout our, our city here and beyond the, through the province. And with the current pandemic, a number of many families have uh, found themselves uh, thrown into poverty. And so it's an important issue for us to be addressing. Alex and Derek are committed to poverty alleviation, both through their research and their community involvement. And uh, we are, again, pr privileged to have them with us this evening. They're going to be talking about uh, what we presently know about the costs of poverty and to the individual and at the societal level. Hope, we hope to underscore the importance of addressing the impacts of poverty at a personal and policy level, and we can learn about resilience as well. So I think it'd be good if we started off by asking, what is poverty? And so Derek, I thought we could turn to you and uh, get your uh, insights. Good evening, and thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to join with you tonight, and thanks for all of you joining at home. So it is good if we're talking about poverty to begin by asking what is this thing that we're talking about? Now, I actually often hesitate to go there because too often when we're talking about poverty, we actually get stuck here. <clears throat> and we get so um, focused on the definition of it that we actually never move beyond that to talk about what we do, do about it. But I'd like to offer a few thoughts about poverty because while about the definition of it, because well, it seems um, straightforward to some, um, there's a lot of things that we often um, you know, don't think about when, when we're talking about poverty. So <clears throat> when we think about poverty, usually the, the first thing that comes to mind is a poverty line. So we say, um, well, uh, who, what, what's the line? Who's above it and below it? And it becomes a very binary kind of definition. You're either poor or you're not poor and we define and determine whether you're poor or not by you know how much how much money you have based on this this poverty line that we establish <clears throat> but when we're actually trying to use a poverty line it's not so simple because there, there's a number that we can choose from depending on how we understand what poverty is so there's two basic ways that we can think about poverty one is what we call an absolute definition of poverty, which means that <clears throat> you're poor if you don't have in our society the income necessary to meet your basic needs. So in Canada, we now have this thing called the market basket measure. 
which is a uh, the new official poverty line for Canada. And basically, what that does is it says, well, what do you need to live a basic standard of to have a basic standard of living in our society? What are all the goods and services we need? And then it's like we go into a supermarket, we throw the ball in a basket, we take it to the checkout, <clears throat> they ring it up, and this, and then they give you the total of how much that costs. So that's the market basket measure. And in case you're interested, um, for a family of four in Calgary, two adults, two kids, <clears throat> in 2018, that number is $48,349 after tax. Now, it'll be di a different amount depending if you've got more people in your household or less, or if you're a single person, but the reference one that the government uses is the, uh, the, the two parents and two kids. Now the question of course is if you've gone into the supermarket with your shopping list, what's on your list? And that's where it gets kind of tricky. So in the government's market basket measure, for example, it includes things like a cell phone and a computer um, and those kinds of things. Now, some people would argue Actually, if you can afford a cell phone and if you can afford a computer, maybe you're not actually poor. <clears throat> Which brings us to the other way that we can understand poverty, which is to understand it relatively, which is to say, it's really not so much about the stuff you have or can't afford. It's how, where are you positioned relative to other people in, in society? <clears throat> and um, when we look at poverty that way, we say, well, if you're um, disadvantaged relative to others up to a certain degree, then we consider you to be poor. And we can measure that in a very different way. <clears throat> we can still find a dollar value, but what we do is we say, what's the median? And for those of you who have long ago forgotten your stats course, the median is the midpoint above which half of the population is above it and half is below it. And you say, what's the median income, the middle point? And then you say you're poor if you're earning less than half of the median. So basically you're in the bottom 25% of people. That's irrespective of whether you've got all these things or not, it's got to do with your position relative to other people. So those are the two ways we can talk about poverty or think about poverty. Um, they still rely, though, on these somewhat arbitrary poverty, poverty lines, which can be, in, in my experience, a little bit clinical. And <clears throat> when we actually speak with people who are living in conditions of poverty, um, they tell us something quite different about poverty. And I think we can um, get a deeper understanding and definition of it by listening to some of those voices. <clears throat> uh, over the years, I've had the privilege and honor of speaking with many people in those um, situations for various reasons. Um, sometimes I've uh, documented those conversations and they give us a sense of the reality of poverty as it is experienced by people. Um, one quote I'll read you, a person who is talking about their experience of poverty, they said they described poverty this way. They said, it's emptiness, destitute, hopelessness, helplessness, sadness, darkness, lost, no identity, no self-esteem, coldness, ashamed, no voice, no family, no grandchildren, no smiles, no privacy, no laughter, no happiness. This is what living in poverty means. So quite a stark um, description of it, <clears throat> which we might expect <clears throat> from somebody who's, who's mired in, in that, that grit of, uh, gritty experience of it. Interestingly though, I've also had the opportunity a number of years ago, I was um, working on developing a poverty strategy for the city. And we went into 
church basements and town halls. And we talked to as many people as we could. And we asked them to give us one word that would describe poverty. And uh, we created a word cloud. And these are some of the, the most frequent words that came out. <clears throat> Scary, lonely, depressed, unjust, divided, unequal, illness, violent, and mean. Now, these aren't people who have necessarily experienced poverty at all. And what's interesting is how closely those words mirror the experience of those who are, who are, who are mired in, in the condition of, of poverty. And what's quite interesting to me is that, I don't know if you picked up on it, but there's a word that's missing in all of those descriptions. And, it's, and I do this a lot um, with classes and people and groups. And typically the word that's missing in all of these descriptions is money. So even though we define poverty in terms of these poverty lines, how much do you make? Are you above it or below it? And so on. When we actually get into the experience of poverty, money actually isn't central to it. And I like to think about poverty as being characterized by <clears throat> three interrelated conditions. The first one, of course, is, and it's what we typically think about poverty, is the condition of scarcity. But I think the idea of scarcity goes very deep in our, in our society. It's not just that I don't have enough, but I think we operate under the assumption and the ideology of scarcity that there is not enough to go around. And if we think about kind of the definition of economics, if we go back to your economics 101 for those of you who took it, um, economics says that um, the role of the economy is to allocate our limited resources to meet unlimited needs. So if you've got unlimited needs and limited resources, automatically we are in a condition of perpetual scarcity. So that's the first dimension of poverty is scarcity. The second is vulnerability. <clears throat> vulnerability comes to us, um, I'll go into a little bit more about it later, but um, in part because of another myth that we operate under, we have the myth of scarcity, but we also have this myth of the autonomous individual that we are supposed to be self-reliant and independent um, beings that don't need anybody else. And yet that um, we know that intuitively is not true. I mean, Aristotle is the one who famously said the man is a political animal, meaning man is by nature intended to live in um, his, the, the, the Greek word for the city state is polis. So he's intended to live um, in a community with other people. That's our fundamental nature. And yet we're told that we are to be independent, which I think is part of this profound sense of vulnerability, which leads to the third dimension of poverty, which is fear. And the fear of poverty arises because of our awareness of both this idea of scarcity and our own vulnerability in the face of it. So this takes us far beyond poverty lines and you know, who's above and below the line. In uh, 2018, the federal government developed a national poverty strategy and for the first time gave us an official definition of poverty for Canada. And that definition is the condition of a person who is deprived of the resources, means, choices, and power necessary to acquire and maintain a basic level of living standards and to facilitate integration and participation in society. So this is interesting because of the words that are chosen. This, of course, talks about living standards and resources and means, but it also says that poverty is a condition of being without choice, being without power, um, and being isolated and cut off from community, that idea of integration and participation. So we're poor, not only because of our material condition, but because of our social position, being without choice, without power, isolated and cut off from community. 
a few years ago, we did a, a research um, study on child poverty, come up with a definition of child poverty, because when we're talking about child poverty, we're not really talking about money anymore because, you know, it's, it's not really possible for uh, a child to go out and, and earn money to, to work themselves out of poverty. And, you know, money is not something that's central to their experience. <clears throat> and we actually interviewed families and children and we found that the experience of poverty for children is very similar. So yes, there's material poverty, but there's also what we learned was what we call structural poverty, which is the lack of supports and systems around and services around people. There's also relational poverty where they don't have those supportive relationships for them. And there's a poverty of self-perception, which is an absence of hope about the future. So I think sort of, that's a lot, this is a long way of of um, giving you a definition. It's easier to say, you know, it's poverty is $48,000 and below. Um, I'd rather leave you with the idea that poverty is very much multidimensional, that it certainly has a material aspect to it, but it also has um, a social aspect, which is about being connected and um, having meaningful relationships in your life and it has a spiritual component, which talks about the a lack of meaning or purpose in life and deep poverty exists where all of those three material, social and spiritual dimensions collide. So that's uh, uh, a long winded way of answering the question, what is poverty? But I hope it gives us something to think about. Well, thank you, Derek. That's very comprehensive, but very helpful as we try to understand more about poverty. Alex, with your expertise in developmental psychology, I wondered if you could help us understand a little bit more about developmental impacts of poverty. Thank you so much, Murray. Um, I'd like to start this by just giving a, a contextual statement. There are large bodies of research on the developmental impacts of poverty. But I don't want you to believe that these apply to every individual who either lives in poverty or who has experienced poverty. Um, it does, however, uh, apply to many individuals. And that is because uh, poverty has really distinctive negative impacts on the mother as she is carrying the child and the child throughout development. And so that's what I would like to focus on, uh, starting from the prenatal period straight through to the end of adolescence and looking at those impacts on the cognitive development, emotional, social, and physical development of the child. So starting in the prenatal environment, we really need to think about how does poverty impact the mother and how does poverty impact the family? And as a whole, one of the most significant things poverty does is it increases daily hassles. And when I'm talking about daily hassles, it, it takes so much longer to accomplish tasks when you don't have a lot of money to buy the easy way out for a lack of a better word, whether it's you have to take transit to drop the kids off or you're not um, buying pre-cooked meals and you're working with limited grocery budget, so you have to go to various locations to hit the sales. All of those daily hassles create stressors on the mother. Other stressors, of course, are relational stressors because the mother is limited in her ability to interact with others um, due to time constraints. There's lack of appropriate nutrition, which impacts the physical development of the child within the womb. And there's income insecurity. And income insecurity, we know that financial stress creates a lot of anxiety in individuals as a whole. These stresses are all increased if the individual, the mother, is um, a minority or identifies with a marginalized population. Other ways that poverty increases stress on the mother and the developing child are things like decreased social support, crowded and chaotic home environments, and a lack of security in the neighborhood within which she's living. 
when there are all of these stressors that are impacting the mother, um, there are negative emotions, needless to say, that goes with it. And there can be a tendency to turn to ways to self-medicate, to make yourself feel better. And we do see increased smoking, alcohol, or drug use uh, when the mother is pregnant. You could see how those variables would work together to impact the infant. And this is what the research shows. So the developing infant in the womb is impacted by the stress hormones that are flooding the mother's system. And it tends to impact them physically because they don't gain weight at the same degree other developing fetuses would. We often see lower birth rates, we see premature deliveries, and research out of Quebec noted a 30% increase in stillbirth and low socioeconomic uh, areas. After the child is born, we tend to see decreased and depressed immune responses and a greater likelihood of them being um, exposed to illnesses, experiencing the illness and having a more severe outcome. Now I want to go back to the developing child in the womb and talk about those stress hormones because those stress hormones are incredibly impactful on the child, specifically the development of the child's brain. So the stress hormones um, directly um, target the hippocampal region of the developing child's brain. Now the hippocampal region is very much involved in uh, memory and learning, cognitive strategies. And it tends to lead to uh, a, a smaller size in the hippocampal region. The stress hormones also um, shape the amygdala or the fear center in the developing child's brain. The amygdala tends to be more responsive to stress triggers um, after the child is born because it's been exposed to stress hormones in uterus throughout the nine months. And what we find with these two um, impacts on the brain is when the infant comes into the world, they tend to be more temperamental. So uh, descriptors for this are difficult or uh, slow to warm up. They tend to be more fussy, don't sleep as well, don't eat as well. They're more difficult to what we call uh, they don't um, take from their mother the emotional regulation and calm their system down uh, as easily as a baby who is very easy when they are born into the world. Now, uh, many of you can recognize what it's like to have uh, a brand new infant in your life. Whether you've been a parent yourself, you've seen it uh, on a sitcom or around you in the neighborhood. Uh, individuals who have had new babies in their environment know there's little time for sleep, little time to take care of yourself. You are uh, very, very involved in that child's care and stressed because you, you do want to do a good job. If you take the stressors that uh, poverty places on the mother, um, the impacts are really significant in this particular time period because it leads to a decrease in the parents being able to be as warm and as responsive as they need to, to the newborn infant. Um, they don't necessarily have the time to always appropriately respond to the infant's need. This can disrupt what we call the attachment profile. And the attachment profile uh, is a procedural memory uh, that's held within the infant. I'm sorry, my voice just cracked there. And it's not something um, you lose throughout your lifespan. It guides your relationships um, from the age of two straight through to the end of your life. And that procedural uh, memory of attachment tells the infant um, and the developing child how the worthy they are of love, how safe and responsive the world is. Can they get help from the world when they seek it? 
um, and it helps them with their emotional regulation. So a good way of explaining the impact would be to compare this to a securely attached child. A securely attached child has had a warm and engaging, appropriately responsive relationship with their parent. They believe they're worthy of love. They know their parent will be there to help them in times of need. And that allows them to do something pretty uh, spectacular. It allows them to explore their environment because they know that the parent is a secure base that they can go back to if there's trouble and they can get help for. Because they explore their environment, they gain new experiences with people, with objects, new environments, and this all promotes cognitive development, emotional development, and social development. For the insecure infant and continuing on throughout the life, um, there is a lack of seeing that secure base, the parental figure as secure. So they are more anxious as they interact with their domain and their, that fear, the anxiety will limit how much they explore the domain. And as a result, we begin to see the start of developmental delays in cognitive, social and emotional development. Furthermore, we'll see delays um, that are directly connected to that amygdala, which I mentioned earlier. Because the child is, or it tends to be, more anxious, their fear ends up reinforcing the fear response within the amygdala. Uh, Larson, a researcher in the domain, has noted there are other uh, impacts from poverty that really continue on uh, to limit cognitive, social, and emotional development. These shouldn't be surprising when there's a lack of financial security, a lack of relational security. Um, we're going to see more stressful home environments. We're going to see decreased resources that are spent on educational supports like books. And coming into childhood, we often find that parents interact with their children in more commands versus discussions. And that is simply because they're short on time. And Derek noted that earlier. There are nutritional limits um, and there is a lack of time spent engaged in supporting verbal development and language development. Because of this, there tends to be a hindrance in uh, the development of a region of the brain called executive functioning. And the executive functioning um, allows us to plan, to problem solve, and it's very key in our verbal development. As a result, we're gonna see these children as they come into school struggling in those domains. Difficulties in attachment and difficulties in emotional regulation, controlling strong emotions like anger, um, learning to follow authority figures, boundaries and rules in our life are all connected to that attachment profile. And if there's an insecure attachment profile, uh, the child won't trust authority figures. They tend not to follow rules. Um, or plan or realize the consequences. That's part of that executive functioning. So they don't tend to do as well within the scholastic domain, whether daycare, kindergarten, elementary, and continuing through. Children who struggle within the school environment are often rejected by their peers, whether they struggle with emotional control or they struggle academically. Um, they will be excluded from the peer group. And of course, they then also struggle with teachers, uh, which leads to them getting into trouble a lot. Sure does not help the self-esteem uh, development. So as they come in to adolescence, 
When they've been excluded and struggled within the scholastic domain, we tend to see adolescents uh, grouped together uh, with like-minded adolescents who have had similar experiences. And as a result, um, they find success in domains outside of the scholastic world. And those might be connected to more uh, behavioral problems, such as uh, delinquent behaviors, the school skipping. And the research has clearly showed that early poverty leads to outcomes such as engagement in uh, the deviant behaviors, but also early pregnancy, early marriage, high school uh, dropping out. So that was just a real quick overview with a whole ton of detail. So I'm, I'm very happy to open this up for questions later. But you can see very clearly how intergenerational poverty can start from experiencing poverty as a mother. Thank you, Alex. You've done an excellent job providing comprehensive information about the challenges that parents face in poverty and the impact on the development of children. And I can imagine, as you just noted, that the audience may have some great questions. So please make sure to put your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen, and we'll have time later on in our program this evening. I remember when I was working in Detroit, teaching entrepreneurship to youth and the challenges that they faced in their environment. They do not have the resources that so many of us take for granted. And so uh, you would see them take you know, one step forward and two steps back and so forth. And so yet, even though these vulnerable youth were living in this environment, I saw signs of strong resilience. And so I wonder, Derek, uh, if you could tell us a bit more about the interplay between you know, vulnerability and resilience. Yeah, so I mean, poverty really is this kind of this balance, right? Um, between those things that make us uh, vulnerable and those things that make us that makes us resilient. So when we're talking about vulnerability, what we're talking about is the degree to which we're exposed to stresses and shocks. So I got a long term stresses like um, um, you know lack of income, or sometimes it's a shock that that comes out of nowhere and hits us. And the, our vulnerability is about um, how much those will impact us depending on a bunch of things. And when we can think, we can think about um, vulnerability in terms of four different types. And <clears throat> the first one we usually go to um, is important, but it's also the one where we usually stop. And those are the individual factors, things about ourselves as, as persons as individuals that make us more vulnerable to poverty. So those are things like education. If you um, don't have a, uh, a high school education, for example, much more likely to be in poverty, um, not having old skills or language, <clears throat> things about our health, ability, or things like addictions, um, all important variables. Oftentimes we look at these maybe in terms of choices that we can make. Um, which can lead us to uh, to blame. So you know, if you only made a different choice, you know, the things would be would be better for you. <clears throat> but these individual factors are only one of four important sets. So the the second one is the life stage. Where we are in the life stage matters tremendously. So when we're in can ages when we're more likely to be in conditions of dependence, either as children or youth or as seniors. We're also more likely to be to be poor, but also caregivers. It's sort of um, sort of vicarious dependency, um, because when we're in a position of caregiving, oftentimes that leaves us more vulnerable too. So we've got individual factors, life stage factors, and then uh, I talked about this earlier: social factors. So our, our social connectivity. Do we have family and community around us? Do we have those social networks, supports? services that we can rely on when stuff happens. And then the last thing is systems. Things about our systems that don't work well. So things like racism and discrimination, colonization, patriarchy, the way our economy is structured, um, 
So now we've got um, you know a huge uh, number of people who are working in precarious jobs who are, uh, they're working but still poor. Um, and uh, also those um, questions of power that we talked about earlier. All of those systemic things can leave us vulnerable to poverty. So that when something happens that you lose a job, um, the family breaks down, somebody gets sick or develops a disability, or there's a disaster uh, like a pandemic or, or like the hailstorm in the Northeast. If, you know, if we have a number of these vulnerabilities that have piled up there, uh, it's more likely that uh, when something happens, we're actually going to spiral into poverty. So for somebody else, it might be a minor inconvenience. But if we have all of these vulnerabilities, um, they compound then um, we're more likely to be in poverty. But <clears throat> I'd urge us to reflect, when we think about those individual things, life stage, social, systemic things, how many of those do we all experience? And if we you know, think about it honestly, um, I have to say that we all have some degree of vulnerability to poverty. It's, it's not, a, again, it's not a line where you're above or below, it's actually a continuum and we're all on it in some way. And uh, I would uh, suggest that we all have an experience of poverty. Uh, we did a survey a number of years ago and surveyed several thousand Calgarians. And, and one of the questions we asked was, have you ever experienced poverty in your life? <clears throat> and shockingly, um, over a third of the people that we surveyed said, yes, they have. Now, if you think that they're connected intimately with at least one other person. You know, it's reasonable to expect that, you know, at least two thirds of the population has some direct knowledge of what poverty is, right? And it, it's that awareness of poverty, it's awareness of our vulnerability, knowing that we have these vulnerabilities that leads to what I was talking about earlier, this fear of poverty. And <clears throat> when we're talking about fear, we start to talk about trauma and trauma and poverty are, are closely related. Both the fact that people who've experienced trauma are more likely to be in, to, to, to fall into poverty. Or if you're in poverty, you're also more likely to, you know, experience some form of trauma. But uh, a point was made by, by a woman I spoke with who is living in poverty, who said that poverty is a condition of trauma, which is something quite different. It's not that you're experiencing poverty or trauma because of poverty, but that poverty itself is a trauma. <clears throat> and if we think about the impacts of trauma that Alex was talking about a, a little bit a few moments ago, um, a few things that are important about trauma. One is when we've experienced trauma, and in, uh, one result of that is disrupted attachment. Difficulty in de developing and maintaining those stable relationships, that's one. And the other is a lack of trust, not only between you and me, but people can develop this sense that the world cannot be trusted. So it's not just, I don't trust you, it's that I don't trust the world around me. <clears throat> which makes the world a scary place. And there's a great fellow, great Canadian community builder who I greatly admire, Paul Bourne. He wrote this book called Deepening Community. And in it, he says that when we are experiencing anxiety and fear, we have a couple of uh, default responses. One is to withdraw. So we separate ourselves from others and we just, we, we retreat into ourselves. We look after ourselves. Kind of sounds like that disrupted attachment. Um, we were talking about or lack of trust. The other response is aggression. So we, we turn against each other. And what both of those do is they really disrupt community. And yet it's the community that we need actually. And it's in the community where we find resilience. So when we're talking about resilience, we can talk about it in a couple of ways. We can talk about it in terms of the, the resilience of a, of a of an individual, of a person. <clears throat> and Alex touched on a few of the things that make people and children resilient. Um, one key one is what we call a sense of coherence, which means that the world is comprehensible. We can understand what's going on in the world around us, but it's also manageable. 
We believe we can influence our environment and the decisions that affect us and that there's meaning in it, that there's meaningfulness. So when we have those things, we tend to be more personally resilient, but that is on its own is not enough. That resilience also, and almost more so, relies on the systems of support that are around us. So this is taking it again beyond the individual and taking it out to the community and we find our resilience in community. So that's having a network of friends and family to turn to in times of stress and crisis, but it's also having those supports and services around us, which then takes us to thinking about the resilience of our systems themselves. So um, if we look at research about what makes a resilient system, that could be a resilient uh, organization or a resilient you know, social service system or community system, that they have a few uh, key important properties. One is a sense of connectedness. So uh, people are connected to each other. There's a sense of solidarity, but also diversity. Not only are they connected with those who are like them, they're also connected with those who are different from them. So we have, so, um, we have what we call bridging relationships with, between, um, between groups that are, that are different. Um, resilient systems are ones where power is shared, not hoarded, uh, right? Uh, they're ones where there's a high degree of cooperation, where we recognize we're interdependent, not independent, and there's a, a high degree of trust both that individual trust, I trust you, you trust me, but also that sense that the world around us can be trusted as well. So trust actually kind of lies at the bottom of all of this. And when we work to create the conditions of, of resilience, we're actually kind of going counter to what scarcity would tell us to do, right? Where scarcity says we need to compete Resilience says we need to cooperate. Where scarcity says we withdraw or turn against each other, we don't trust each other. To be resilient says we actually have to trust each other. Where um, scarcity and fear would say, I'm gonna keep to my own. Uh, resilience says we actually need to reach out and connect with those who are different from us and un unlike us. And that's actually where we find resilience. So we actually have to do the opposite of what um, we think that that we uh, probably need to do uh, when we're faced with with uh, conditions of, of scarcity fear and anxiety thank you derek that helps us understand how we each have vulnerabilities and fears to a greater or lesser extent and how we how we respond is critical but you know as people we are in community or with a social group and so they also have a significant impact on us as you have just highlighted. Alex, I'd like to turn to you. Um, the research, uh, as we know, talks about and points to poverty prevention. So I would like to ask you, I guess, if you could speak to a little bit about why is prevention important? Well, yes, Murray, I'll, I'll briefly speak to that and, and then maybe look at some effective uh, preventions from an individual level. Um, a recent report, and it was the report is called Poverty Costs, and it was engaged in by many agencies and individuals within the Calgary area and the Alberta area. They noted that the estimated costs of working with the impacts of poverty in Alberta ranges from 7.1 to 9.5 billion dollars a year. Tremendous financial costs. Yet other research has clearly indicated that uh, prevention strategies and reduction strategies actually cost about 50% less than the intervention strategies. And so I'd like to just slip straight into what does an individual intervention strategy look like uh, to protect or support a developing child? There are so many early intervention strategies within the Alberta area. I can't 
go about naming them all. We'd be here for the rest of the night. But they're all engaged in a similar strategy to protect and support the family during the first 2,000 days of a child's life. So the first five years to ensure there is healthy brain development, there is healthy attachment, um, there are aids to support if there are developmental difficulties within the school system. So early intervention strategies are going to include hospitals, educational systems, individual psychologists, social workers that work with the family, that work with community, uh, specialists that will work with specific needs in the child's life. They are um, many and they work often together in a wraparound uh, way to try and protect and support the child and the family. But Derek, could I pass this off now to you to talk to community? Yeah, so we need to be working at both levels. We need to be working with the individual, but we also need to be working at that community level. And often because we tend to focus on those individual factors that leave us vulnerable to poverty, um, often there's uh, an, a strong emphasis on that in, on those individual interventions, which of course are critically important, but there's this other piece of work we need to do as well, which is, which is the community piece. And I'd like to suggest that if um, we're talking about poverty in terms of this um, sense of trauma that is around it, that um, I think we all are sort of um, connected to in some way because of our, our sense of vulnerability and our, our kind of inbred uh, belief in scarcity and, and our fear of that, then I like to think of poverty in terms of uh, being a condition of woundedness, which leads to a much different kind of intervention, which we're, we're no longer talking about fixing poverty and fixing systems, we're actually talking about healing. And how do we do that? Um, <clears throat> the fellow I mentioned earlier, Paul Bourne, who talked about those responses of, of aggression or, or withdrawal. He says there's actually a third response, which is the, the response of coming together. And he suggests there are a series of healing strategies that we can focus on. And the one is begins with sharing our stories, which leads to us to start actually enjoying each other, um, which then leads to us caring for each other, which then eventually leads to us being able to work together. And for me, as I said, uh, the root of, of um, poverty is this fear this trauma, these disrupted relationships. So where we start is by rebuilding that sense of trust in each other, but also in the world around us. Because when we have that trust, that lays the foundation for everything else that we need to do. Because that's what we need to do to create these conditions of resilience that we talked about. So resilience um, emerges when we have um, connectedness, shared power, diversity, cooperation, all things that require trust in order for them to, uh, to happen. And when we're able to do that, um, we start to uh, move away from those maladaptive responses and it allows us to work together, which is what ultimately we need to do in order to solve the challenges that are confronting us as a community. And that's where we get to, to what I uh, prefer to talk about, which is abundance rather than scarcity because uh, scarcity emerges really because we don't trust that there's enough for everyone. And so we act on that belief. But if we actually you know, stop and operate it under the belief that there is enough and uh, we were able to trust each other and trust the world around us, um, we'd actually able, be able to do the things that are necessary for that to become, to become real. So it shifts us away from this narrative of scarcity um, moves us beyond withdrawal aggression to more positive responses uh, of interdependence and cooperation. So I use the acronym of, of ART, which is the conditions of abundance and resilience and trust is the counterpoint to the condition of scarcity and vulnerability 
and fear, which is the condition that we're, we're we want to move from and move towards this other condition of uh, deep abundance. Thank you both, Alex and, and Derek. I um I wanted to share just briefly uh, when I was in Toronto many decades ago, I was working with a community group and we had a coffee shop. And so I see that as another way as far as poverty reduction is by the business, the community, uh, business community can be employing um, all, from all sectors of society and giving opportunities for people to learn job skills, life skills, have a living wage and so on. So there's a lot of ways I think that those of us watching today can be involved and engaged. And uh, this is a good time, I think, for folks to be putting in their questions in the Q&A section. We've got a number of good ones already, but uh, please make sure as the conversation unfolds, and we're just in the last few questions, please make sure to get your uh, questions in. So I gave an example of uh, a coffee shop in Toronto, but I wonder, uh, Derek, if you might be able to tell us a little bit of what's going on in Calgary, what's, what groups and organizations are doing, those that are committed to poverty reduction and alleviation. There's lots going on. Um, uh, programs and services we've got um, over a thousand programs and services that are being offered, um, you know, to address the impacts of poverty. But if we're thinking about what do we do actually to prevent poverty and deal with it at that that bigger level, Calgary actually has a poverty reduction strategy, which is called Enough for All, which is based on that idea that there is enough for all. We're, that we actually aren't living in this condition of scarcity, but there, but we have enough. Um, we can share it, and the enough for all strategy is being uh, coordinated by a great organization here in town called Vibrant Communities Calgary, and vibrantcalgary.org, I believe it is. Um, if you want to check them out, and they've got three goals. One is to um, ensure everyone has the income and assets we need to thrive, and. Uh, so there's some great work. Um, we have some great partners in business uh, doing things like you were mentioning, Murray, uh, making sure that you know people are paid a living wage and have decent work uh, available to them. So when we have those opportunities for people, then we can thrive. Um, works towards building inclusive communities, so building those support networks around people. And then the third uh, goal for the Enough for All strategy is uh, reconciliation with our Indigenous peoples. Um, so Enough for All, that's one. There's another organization that I uh, have been involved with and believe strongly in. It's called Cal the Calgary Alliance for the Common Good. It's a network of faith, labor, uh, nonprofit, and uh, educational institutions. Ambrose University is a member of it. Uh, it's about 35,000 people strong and it's all based on relationship and it, their, the goal is to um, organize the power of our communities in order to shape a just and compassionate city. So these are people from all walks of life who are coming together um, and uh, speaking out and doing the work that's necessary in order to make sure that Calgary works for, for everybody. So those are a couple of um, great initiatives and organizations that uh, I think are making a real difference here, here in the city. Thank you, Derek. Our time is coming to a close for the presentation period. So again, we're looking for questions. Again, we've got quite a number coming in. So thank you for that. I wondered if uh, I could ask each of you if you have any uh, closing remarks you'd like to add. Let's start with you, Alex, if you have some thoughts. Um. I think to interrupt the intergenerational poverty cycle is, is so important. And when I listen to uh, Derek speak about how do we create resiliency and that need for the interdependence in the community, I, I think back to the, the attachment platform and we can rewrite the attachment platform through relationship at any age. And it's through uh, a relationship that is willing to become a trusted relationship. And it provides a sense of hope and optimism. And I just think what a, what a wonderful thing to remember as we go forward. Derek? I think um, 
what I'd like to leave us with is the idea that um, we're all affected by poverty. And there's often, when we talk about poverty lines, we tend to think about there's this, you know, this group of people called the poor and um, either we need to fix them or help them in some way. And actually um, there isn't any group of people called the poor. We're all, we all experience some form of poverty and some sort of vulnerability. <clears throat> there's a, um, a fellow out of the States, uh, Jim Wallace, who I quite uh, enjoy following his work. And uh, <clears throat> he's um, from what he would call the progressive Christian tradition. Uh, and he, he poses the question, he said, why, why is it in, in uh, the, the Jesus or in, in our scripture and tradition that God cares so much about the poor? So the reason is, well, there's many reasons, but one reason is that the poor are like the canary in the coal mine. They're the most vulnerable in our society. So when they're not thriving, it, it's not about, um, it. well, it is about the condition of, of those who are poor, but it's also telling us something about the environment that we're living in. And so when we can see that everybody is thriving, that means that we're all when, when those who are most vulnerable are thriving, it means that we're all living in an environment where, where we can thrive as well. So poverty really is about all of us. That's why I answer the question, why and you know, developmental aspects of poverty, why should it matter to you? It should matter to you because it, it's something, uh, it tells us something about the world and the, the environment that we're all living in. Okay. Well, thank you. This has been a tremendous uh, opportunity for us to learn from each of you, from your experiences, your work in the community and so forth. Now we have a chance for folks to ask questions and uh, I see a number of come in. And so I've got them just on the screen here. And so I will ask the first one and I don't necessarily see them necessarily being directed to either one of you. So I'll ask the question and you can decide who would like to respond. So the first question is, so from a trauma or attachment standpoint, how do we help a mother or father move on from their trauma in such a way that their children don't have the same attachment style? That might be Alex, I'm not sure, but. Uh... From a trauma standpoint, and I, I wish um, I had a little clarity there. If we're considering uh, poverty as the trauma, how do we help on an individual level? How do we support that mother? And I really think this is what I was alluding to earlier. So I'm hoping that I'm answering the question the individual has asked. Um, being part of the community and developing, being willing to develop those long-standing supporting relationships begins to decrease things like uh, daily stressors. If you can be a helping hand, that begins to decrease some of the hassles. It also in, um, earns you some trust with the individual. And as that in mother experiences uh, relationships that she can rely on uh, that do decrease her, her stress, we be begin to literally address uh, the attachment profile through those interactions. But they occur across time. They're not quick and easy. And it requires the person to accept the individual um, as they are without judgment, um, to be able to uh, not react negatively if they have an emotional dysregulation, but to be willing to listen and help them self-soothe. So I think, I think I'd leave it at, at that without some specific directives. Okay, thank you. <laughs> And those connections, sorry, Derek, I don't know if you had another comment, but um, those connections are so important. I mean, each of you have highlighted the importance of relationships and trust and community and not being solo or isolated. It's so hard during the pandemic, I think. Even those of us in, in, the, in a work, work environment, it's so difficult sometimes to build those relationships. So I wonder how, how, how is this happening in the urban community and in, in, in communities where they're working with uh, either homeless or others that are in, in need, 
how can we develop those connections of community during the pandemic, do you think? Derek, do you wanna? Mm -hmm. Well, now this is the, uh, the kicker about resilience, right? Is that the work needs to happen before the event, right? So when, and this, I think it really highlights some of the vulnerabilities that we were uh, living with and we're maybe unaware of that we do have sort of this crisis of community and crisis of loneliness. And when the pandemic hit, it really just highlighted it. Um, so it's really the work that we really needed to have been doing um, for a very long time. Now that we're in it, uh, what do we do? There have been some great, um, uh, really spontaneous um, acts of community that have emerged with uh, in neighborhoods, right? Where I, I know of a lot of um, mutual aid groups that sprung up, neighbors helping neighbors, making sure they got groceries, um, Facebook groups popping up, which, which are wonderful. Still, I worry that for those who were already excluded before, they may still not be part of those of those networks. Um, so, if I might uh, bring up the name Paul of Paul Born again, the, this book that I quite like, he talks about. Um, he says, "Why uh, people ask him what's the most important thing you can do to end poverty?" He says, "Is bring chicken soup to your neighbor." And uh, so well, that sounds kind of too simple. He says, well, yeah, it sounds simple, but <clears throat> in order to bring soup to your neighbor, you need to know your neighbor well enough to talk to them, to know that they like soup, to know when they're sick. Um, and, uh, you know, they need to be comfortable with you bringing the soup. So the work actually starts long before your neighbor gets sick or you bring them the soup. And that's the, the, uh, the work that we need to do. So I'd say that's the work it's never too late to start. And we all can do that in uh, whatever, um, in our neighborhoods, in our, in our faith communities, uh, workplaces, where, wherever we are. So it really is that, that very personal act of, of reaching out and, and it's up to all of us. You know, I was just reading, uh, I guess it was uh, this morning or yesterday about a Haitian American woman in Miami who cooks a thousand meals a week for her neighbors. Now she's connected to a church and that church provides the, the, the money, so to speak, but she does all the shopping, all the cooking and all the delivery. And she says, I do not want anyone to leave hungry or to not be fed. And so this is her commitment through her faith community. And so we have a question here, how can churches be involved in poverty healing strategies? Um, there, there was a great um, initiative. It's changed a little bit now, but some people might have been familiar with it. Um, it was called In From the Cold, hmm. where churches opened up their basements uh, to people who were homeless on a kind of on a rotating basis. Um, and um, In From the Cold is no longer using their network of churches anymore. They now have a more permanent shelter for people. But... <clears throat> I really liked the the idea of that not I mean if there was some critique of it and say so, well you're not kind of dealing with the root cause of homelessness right um, you're just kind of giving a putting a band-aid on it by giving people a room for the night but they're still homeless the next day which you know, might be true um, but I think the real value of that was that it connected people who were living in homelessness with people who would never ever have um, had the opportunity to interact and meet and get to know um, people who are living uh, in those conditions. And by building those bridges, I think it really changed how we think about homelessness and think about poverty because it provided the opportunity to establish those kinds of relationships. <clears throat> so I would say the most important thing that churches can do is anything that builds those relationships and breaks down that us and them kind of divide. It's, it, it's not about you know, collecting food for the food bank. That's wonderful to do, 
um, and I'm not saying don't do it, but in addition to those kinds of things, um, we need to have an opportunity for people to get to know each other and to break to break down those divides. So whether that's a, uh, you know, in, in COVID times, it's it's a little difficult, but um, when we're not in COVID times, I uh, know of a number of churches that have community suppers and as everybody's welcome. And uh, and we, we gather around the table. So, you know, I'd say anything like that, that um, churches can do is very positive. And then also, you know, think about the, the bigger picture about, um, you know, policies and uh, and those system things too, because churches have historically been very active in those kinds of social issues. It's thanks to the churches that the slave trade was ended. Um, so churches do have a, a strong tradition of social action as well. Say so both that individual and, and the, the more um, higher level action is important. And Alex made some excellent points earlier uh, about building trust and relationships. And I say that's both directions. On the, on, in the uh, urban community, um, the folks that I've had the uh, opportunity to work with, they did not necessarily trust anyone around them. And Alex has highlighted that. And so how do you build trust? It's not just by coming in and out just for a moment. It's by that longer term conversation, that longer term relationship. When I work with the homeless teens in Toronto, it was they didn't trust me at the start. But at the drop-in center, I was faithfully there and they got to know me and got to see me consistently. And as Alex said, without judgment, you can't say, well, I'm higher than you. And, and Derek just mentioned that, being open to others. And so I've been in a church where a homeless man would come every week and he might be a little bit disruptive and the community allowed him to be in that church. And so often we have this sense of what's prim and proper and what does it mean to accept people for who they are and where they're at? So. Uh, the church has so many resources in it, not only the, the members and their, their uh, economic resources, but their, their time, their relational ability and, and opportunity to build and connect with the people in the community. So we have, um, these questions are not necessarily in any thematic order, but let's see the next question. Um, to what extent would affordable childcare contribute to the creation of an environment that would help prevent the stress experienced by pregnant women who are vulnerable to poverty. Poverty, And so Alex, you might be someone who might speak into that. Well, you saw me jump up and down and go, amen. Was it, it, it that obvious? Affordable <laughs> childcare is, is phenomenal. Um, number one, affordable childcare placements are watched over by the government and the training of the daycare providers um, is at a level that they can work to facilitate development across all domains in the child. It also gives the mother some free time to do whatever it is she needs to do, including be able to get to work, um, know her child's in a safe place being cared for, and uh, she can pick up the child at the end of the day. They can have some quality time together um, before the child falls asleep. Daycare provides ways of catching developmental disabilities, as does kindergarten. And it provides uh, the mother, or if it is the father, a, a way to earn an income. So it is a significant piece in raising the self-esteem of the mother or the father, providing them relationships within the work world, uh, providing the child what they need for support and development. So absolutely, um, but Derek, I, I'll let you take it from here. Well, not much to add other than, I mean, childcare is one of those things where with one uh, fell swoop, you achieve so many uh, overlapping objectives. You have an economic impact. Quebec was the first uh, province to uh, introduce, uh, what was it $10 a day daycare? Um, and they had, it made a huge impact on the economy. Um, you have an impact on um, health uh, of the family, of the child. You have an impact on the long-term development of the child because you um, overcome a lot of the things that Alex was talking about earlier. So um, 
very, very smart investment uh, that will pay tremendously in so many ways down the road. Where you, Alex, you were talking earlier about the cost of poverty it was between 7.5 and $9 billion a year in Alberta. And that, that estimate's from a number of years ago. You start to make investments like this, uh, which cost far, far less. Um, and then you start to see the, the benefits down the road. We don't have all of those huge costs uh, to society. Thank you. I see one of the questions is what book did Paul Bourne write? And I wrote down here, Deepening Community. So I believe that was the name of it, Deepening Community. There you have it on screen. Thank you, Derek. So we'll continue on with the um, looking at child development, if you will. And so looking at generational poverty, this is so important and so interesting, Alex, thank you. Um, what is the psychology behind it? If you might, I guess, see kind of the trajectory of that. And is there anything that can be done to stop it? The, the, the questioner asks, would educating children about it from a young age help? Are there even ways to prevent it from an individual standpoint? So. This is an area you're familiar with, I'm sure. Hmm. The psychology behind it, um, it really is what we call a developmental psychopathology framework. And that framework uh, speaks to the fact that when you get multiple variables that are, are negative, they interact over time. And um, they interact across development. And the further you go in development, uh, the more uh, profound the impacts or the detriments are to the individual. With teaching a child from a young age about what they're experiencing, and I'm, I'm wondering if that's the question, would it limit uh, uh, the outcomes? And uh, no, I, I, I don't think so. But I'm going to flip this a bit um, and speak to teaching children about it from a young age. So uh, Dr. John Brooks wrote a book on homelessness uh, to be used as an educational module within uh, elementary school system. And educating, I, I think, children in society as a whole about, you know, the fact that there are groups of people that have struggles, but they're still uh, individuals and they still are part of our community and they still deserve our support. That begins to open discussions, um, recognition and acceptance uh, from children straight through to adulthood. So I think that begins to change the community's response as a whole. I think teaching parents, uh, especially young parents, about the impacts on the developing child and how those are often lifelong struggles. I think that is an amazing intervention strategy. Um, and we've got some great schools in Calgary. Uh, Louise Dean is a great example of this, who spend uh, time working with uh, the young mothers, uh, both while they're pregnant and after delivery helping them understanding themselves, their own difficulties, getting them psychological help, but also helping them understand that developing infant and what they need to do to ensure the best outcomes across time. They even have programs they run for uh, uh, the fathers of the children, if they're interested, to provide the beginning of a systems approach, begin to make sure the family is a whole and safe unit. They provide them community within the school and that community often continues after they graduate. So uh, a couple of examples of how we could work this. Murray? Sure. sure. The, um, sorry, I didn't hear it correctly. Um, so we have another question here um, about the neurodevelopment of children. There's been a lot of research done on that, of children raised in poverty. What, uh, what research has been done with specific attention to the Indigenous community? Are you familiar Murray, with I'm not familiar, not enough to comfortably speak, um, but trauma and difficulties during pregnancy 
uh, will have those neurobiological impacts uh, straight across um, the board. So, of course, Indigenous communities have experienced so many traumas and so many difficulties. Um, and even feeling part of the larger Calgary community, if I was just to stick to Calgary, um, is difficult. And finding a place of trust is difficult. So uh, given the variables and the research as a whole, you could understand there would uh, be the possibility for intergenerational trauma or poverty to continue. They, uh, Indigenous populations have something that uh, is really key in the resiliency aspect that I think we could all learn from. That's the importance of community and the importance of the elder and elders and the family life and extended family networks surrounding the development of the child, right? It's not just a parent and a child. So um, variables to consider, I think, on both sides. But Derek? I think um, a couple thoughts. Um, when we're dealing with um, poverty in the Indigenous community, yeah, we're, we're talking about intergenerational trauma, uh, which is why we need to move, you know, beyond um, just the individual focus, but looking at those systemic issues, right? So there's nothing uh, genetic that predisposes one to be in poverty. There's something about um, uh, being a person caught up in sy the system of, of colonization, right? Of racism and discrimination. And so on all of these things that work, that form the context of your life, right? So when we're thinking about intergenerational poverty, whether it's um, in the indigenous world or, or, or non-indigenous, we also have to ask the question, well, why is it that people continue to be in poverty generation after generation? It's certainly not a genetic uh, condition, right? It, it is about um, growing up in a set of circumstances um, where there is, uh, there, there are these things, you know, there's, um, there is discrimination and so on. So we have to ask, those questions as well. Um, uh, yeah, there is uh, neuropathology at work, but it's it's at work because there's all these, the, you know, this bigger structure that the people are embedded in. So we have to look at those structures too. You know, we've often, thank you, Alex and Derek, we've often uh, heard the phrase, you know, blaming the victim and so on. And it's not just the individual that's part of the, the poverty situation, as you've been highlighting, it's the community, it's the larger socioeconomic situation. And so this question, and maybe I'll address it to Derek first, is looking at the resilient system and not only the resilient individual. And so the question is basically, in addressing power imbalances, such as racism, patriarchal views, and so forth, are we working towards community that we could consider more resilient through this? Absolutely. Um, when we're looking at what are what makes a system resilient, um, it is things like trust, cooperation, high social capital, diversity, uh, shared power, tolerance of this tolerance of dissent. I mean, those are the things um, one that allow us to work together because that's what we actually need to do when we're in a crisis. Um, there's a great book by the by a guy named Andrew Zoli who wrote this book called uh, Resilience, Why Things Bounce Back. And he said, if you take a self-interested person against and pit him against another self-interested person in a game, and they'll pit him against a cooperative person in a game, the self-interested person wins every time. You take a group of self-interested people and pit them against a group of cooperative people, the cooperative people work at, win every time because it's actually our ability to cooperate and work together that is what's allowed our human species to thrive. We, it's not, it hasn't been our ability to compete, but it's our ability to cooperate and work together. So when we build 
uh, communities that are diverse, open, where we share power, where there's high levels, levels of trust and cooperation, all that stuff, that's what makes us resilient. When we can actually um, rise up in the face of uh, crises. I mean, Calgary is a good example. I remember the flood. Um, communities where, neighborhoods where uh, the, the community um, rallied around each other did far better in recovering from the flood than those that, that didn't. So yeah, resilient systems require those properties and that's what gets us through times like this. Do you have a comment, Alex? I think I just heartily agree at this point. Okay. I really do think uh, Derek's captured it there. Thank you. So in the School of Business, we are educating our business leaders who are graduating to be connected to the community, to care about the community, to be engaged. And so I'm curious what thoughts you might have around um, companies, in, uh, businesses, what impact they can have, how they can engage actively in this important issue. I mean, my history has been involved with workforce development, entrepreneurship education. Both of those, I think, dovetail nicely into our conversation this evening. But I'm curious if you've, what examples you've seen, but also what other, other thoughts you might have about how, about how business and industry can um, uh, participate and, and help our communities. So I maybe can just start this and I'll pass it off to Derek. There have been some fantastic examples within the Calgary area on a more individual level, but also on a research level. Uh, companies that have chosen to support research projects looking at how do we create uh, really good attachment profiles in families. Uh, right to uh, large companies within the Calgary area today that match children, youth really, who are struggling with key people within uh, the agency who they mentor over a few year period. So the, the youth develop skills, they develop self-esteem, and we begin to get that attachment relationship, right, between the mentor and the youth. So just really fantastic stuff within the Calgary area. Derek? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, the role of business in addressing not only poverty, but a whole range of um, pressing social issues. And um, what excites me is this new idea, well, it's, it's maybe not so new anymore, it's been around for a little while, but the idea of shared value, that companies um, that create not only economic value for themselves, but uh, value in the community, social value actually do better. So companies that pay a living wage, for example, are more productive. Um, companies that uh, engage in the community, in the community uh, as uh, partners tend to be more innovative. They uh, have more risk tolerance and so on. So a lot of um, companies are coming to understand uh, that um, not only is it good for the community, it's also really good for business. When, when, we, when we do these, um, uh, when, you know, when, when, when we engage in practices that create value for our employees as well as for the community around us, we tend to, tend to do better. And there, thank you, Alex and Derek. There's been so many examples of companies. And I was just talking with one of my alums uh, the other day, and he's working with, I think the startup is called Scrap. And they, what they do, our food chain, there's significant, uh, I think it's 50% waste, both either after restaurants or in grocery stores. Maybe the produce is a little older or not as beautiful. And so what do they do with it? And so this is a, a new app that is trying to figure out how can we make these resources available to those that can't afford the full price, but it's still good food. It just may not look as pretty as the market would normally purchase. So there's lots of businesses out there, I think, that are trying to seek to help the society. Sometimes we call them social enterprises, but they're looking at ways that they can impact and improve our culture and our community, and yet still be in, in, in a business that's, uh, that's thriving. So excellent. Well, Alex and Derek, we are just so thankful to have each of you here with us and bringing your expertise and your knowledge, your experiences, your engagement in the community. 
Um, I know our students really appreciate both of you for what you bring to the classroom, the knowledge they gain and so on. And so we are just, again, so privileged to have you uh, with us here tonight. And I'm sure uh, as I did, we learned, so all of us probably learned something new tonight. And I think we're inspired by this, inspired not just about the knowledge, but how can we act? And so you've given us some excellent answers to questions about how we can get involved through our churches, through our businesses, our, our neighborhoods. And it's all about building relationships, all about respecting and honoring other people, giving dignity to those who may be disenfranchised or not as a resource as we are, allowing them to be respected as God's creation, as an individual as equal as we are. And so building those relationships and building trust not one of judgment and I'm gonna help you that's quite patriarchal, but one that's communal and more relational. And there's lots of avenues that we've heard about tonight. So with that, I'll turn it over to Marva for some concluding comments. Thank you both. Well, let me just echo what uh, Murray just said. Thank you so much, Derek and Alex, and also to you, Murray, for being uh, with us this evening. Um, I have so enjoyed this, this uh, lecture this evening, and I would like to thank all of our participants who joined us as well. Um, as one of the alums of Ambrose University, I'm always thrilled to find different ways that we can connect virtually together. And who would have thought a year and a half ago when we first thought about doing a public lecture virtually, it was like, mm, who's gonna log on? And like, I like to remind everybody, this is one of the positives of this crazy pandemic time we find ourselves in. It laid the groundwork to be so simple to do that. So um, as we conclude the three public lectures for this semester, I just want all of you watching to know that we will be back in the fall, uh, hoping to do five public lectures next, uh, next academic year. So three in the fall, two in the spring, but there are still events happening virtually at Ambrose that you can participate in. So in the chat, area, you will find that there is a link to our events page at Ambrose. We have a number of uh, arts events that are going to be happening over the next few weeks that I know that you will want to participate in. So be sure to check that out. So until next time, be sure to continue to stay physically distant, but socially connected. Thanks everyone for joining us and good night.